And without further ado, again, welcome, welcome, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So happy to be here with you all. So happy to be making our way through this book. Many of you have the book and following. No problem if you haven't been here for another chapter, because tonight, tonight's a really good chapter. Tonight is purifying obscurations and acquiring merit. Mm. That's it. What else do we need to do? It's our ongoing work. And I, in reviewing this chapter, it's, it's, it's quite pithy. There's actually only three passages. So as many of you know, Matthew Ricard, a wonderful author, monk, and practitioner, he put together his favorite teachings for each of these themes. Each of these themes is quite literally making our way through the path towards enlightenment. And it's beautiful the way he set it up. It's, it's traditional in a lot of the ways that Buddhist practices, especially Tibetan Buddhist practices are laid out and he lays them out for us with his favorite teachers. So the wisdom that he has found so useful. This evening, there's only three selections. So we have a kind of a smaller amount of text to work with, but very powerful. And I think tonight we'll do something just a tiny bit different, which is, um, I'll actually set us up for our first meditation by reading the first passage. Then we can discuss that. And then I would like us to do a second meditation. Uh, there's two meditations that are actually almost three meditations that are referenced in this short chapter. And I think they're very powerful and worthwhile. So I will, instead of going straight into meditation, we'll just take maybe 10 minutes or so to set up. So I'm just a tiny delay to that experience. So I hope that will uh, be okay for us all. I think it'll really improve um, our experience. So I'm gonna begin for those of you who have the book on page 131, and I'm gonna read just a bit of the introduction. So the introduction here, um, again, this is how Mathieu Ricard is really pulling together uh, his understanding and He's just such an elegant and eloquent writer. It's so understandable. There's nothing about it that feels far away. So he says here, on the Buddhist path that corresponds, uh, on the Buddhist path, um, that corresponds to the two stages called purification and accumulation. Purification doesn't mean washing some kind of original impurity out of our human nature. If our human nature was inherently bad, it would be useless to try to make it pure, just as we cannot make a piece of coal white by washing it even for centuries. Rather, we purify or remove the obscurations that veil our true nature, or what we might call original goodness. This purification is like extracting gold from its ore. The impurities are removed to reveal its brilliance and natural perfection or it can be compared to the wind driving away the clouds that hide the sun. The sun's light remains unchanged. It was already bright, even when hidden. So important for us to take in the images that these words point to. Already good, already like gold, already the radiant light of the sun. This is so healing, this is so often different than how many of us have a self view or what we feel viewed by society or culture or family or, or whomever. And I remember Mathieu, when I first heard him speak in 2000 actually, and he used this metaphor that our destructive emotions are just like dust on the gold and the gold is our heart. It made a huge impact on me. I'd never, I'd never heard anything like that before. And so it's beautiful to hear him still, I think this book came out in maybe 2014, um, still really referencing that idea of our true gold. And so, cause purification, you know, I, I think it can have a little bit of a, maybe a weight or a sentiment that there's something wrong or bad and we have to purify that. So it's really, I think, interesting to think of it in this different way of just, kind of bringing what isn't working for us to the surface, to let it be seen, to let it be pierced, to let it be then opening up to the light that's already there. And he then describes that Buddhism distinguishes two types of obscuration, 
that must be eliminated by this process. The obscuration of disturbing emotions, such as desire, hatred, ignorance, pride, and jealousy. And the more subtle conceptual obscuration, which prevents us from seeing the ultimate nature of things. So the first one, hopefully we're familiar, disturbing emotions, or what I often call destructive emotions, <clears throat> when we enact our um, emotions in a way that's harmful to ourselves and others. And then the second, the subtle conceptual one, uh, you may remember two weeks ago, we finished up our really long chapter on, um, on essentially the paramitas. I'm trying to remember what the name of that chapter was. But in that chapter, we went through all of the essential ways that we gain merit. So that's generosity, discipline, patience, joyous effort, and concentration. And so we think of this as, <clears throat> um, you know, quite an interesting way to bring forth our merit. But when we talk about the obscuration, and especially the subtle one, what really gets in the way is not having wisdom. So he writes it as it prevents us from seeing the ultimate nature of things. And that's, you know, another way of it prevents us from our true wisdom, seeing the interdependence, seeing the impermanent nature. So our obscurations, first off, working with our destructive, disturbing emotions, yay. <laughs> our second process is, is wisdom and they're so connected. You know, our wisdom comes from seeing these destructive, disturbing emotions, recognizing them as temporary, understanding their true nature. As much as we'd like to point our fingers and say that our emotions are because of someone else, when we look closely, when we work with them, we see how much they are our responsibility and ours to work with. Um, yeah, and so then I'm going to set us up for the meditation here by reading a bit from the passage by Dilgul Kensi Rinpoche. And this is <clears throat> just the next page, 132. He starts off essentially saying that... Um, in past lives up until now, he feels certain that there's been wrongdoing in his life, accumulated wrongdoing, harm that he's caused to others. Whether or not that is part of your worldview, we can recognize that in this lifetime, there are certainly things we've done that we regret. There are certainly patterns we've strengthened, habits that we've made kind of almost unconscious that don't really serve us. And what he wants to say is that our situation is not hopeless. Uh, the only good thing about our wrongdoings is that they can be purified, but our negative actions are compounded phenomena, so they are impermanent. Therefore, as the Buddha said, there can be no fault so serious it cannot be purified by the four powers. I also just, I love that. It, it's familiar for many of us as practitioners, but that there is absolutely no fault so serious it can't be purified. That is not often how our justice system works, uh, among many other things, right? Someone is guilty and they're wrong and they're bad forever and let's put them far away. Um, so I, I like this idea of really seeing ourselves as there's nothing that can't be purified. And then the four powers. So this is the meditation we will do is we'll make our way through these four powers. So I'll, I'll read them a little bit and then we'll practice with them. The four powers are the means through which purification of all wrongdoing can be affected. The first power is the power of support. Support here refers to the person or deity to whom we acknowledge and confess our faults, who thus becomes the support for our purification. And he suggests Vajrasattva, very traditional and classic choice. I suggest for us, the Sangha. We are each other's support. We are here for that. And I think that's a really meaningful consideration. I'm not uh, imploring you to share all of the What happened? Something. No, we're good. Okay. My Bluetooth got a little funky. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that at this moment 
We need to exercise that power of support by sharing all the wrongdoings and all the difficulties, but to say that in this meditation, the support is coming from each other. Um, so in this meditation, you can start thinking now, I will be asking us to consider one thing you'd like to work with, one thing you'd like to purify. There's so many to choose from, but maybe one that comes to mind today, maybe something you're already working on, something you could use this support, this opportunity to purify. So this could be a habit of self-criticism. This could be a habit of criticizing others. This could be those subtle ways that we maybe overfill our days, prevent us from the kind of presence that we want for practice. This could also be, you know, a habit of uh, indulging our anger in a way that's destructive or harmful. Maybe through refreshing our news feed or our social media feed in ways that just, you know, it feels good in the moment, but it just cultivates the wrong roots for us. So just thinking about uh, what we might want to use in this meditation. So this first power of support, the person, deity or sangha, <laughs> who we acknowledge and confess our faults and who becomes our support. The second power is the power of regret. This is a sticky one. Most of us are pretty good at regret even sliding right into shame and self-criticism. But this is actually, we talked about this with the Guide for the Bodhisattva. This is that healthy remorse. And what is described here is that regret arises naturally when we realize that the suffering we have experienced up until now in all our numerous rebirths in samsara has been caused by our own wrongdoing. As long as you remain unaware of the consequences of your actions, the consequences your actions will bring, you will just go on behaving like a fool. But once you see clearly how your past wrongdoings is what has kept you wandering in the interminable suffering of samsaric existence, you are bound to be stricken with deep remorse about the negative actions you've committed, completely losing any urge to repeat them. So that's kind of the part. The goal of regret is not to make a whole campaign against yourself and your past wrongs. It's the inspiration that allows us to let go and stop. And it's true, you know, we, we, it's painful. I, I'm sure many of you experienced this on retreat. We might have an insight into ways we've been living. Maybe again, for me, I've definitely had this one of self-criticism and realizing, you know, the cost of self-criticism, how much it's kind of held me back, how much it's broken my own heart. And, almost to the point of feeling nauseated by it. I think that that's actually an important place for us to reach. So this place of, of regret is, is pretty important, um, pretty important to soberly look at and see the cost, the true cost of what these habits bring for us. So support, regret, then antidote. Regret itself is not enough. The negative actions of the past have to be purified. This is done with the third power, the power of antidote. All negative actions committed with the body, speech, and mind must be counteracted with their antidotes, positive actions of body, speech, and mind. And that's what we'll be doing tonight as we bring forth this area we'd like to work on for support and feeling the regret the antidote that we will actually work on together is one of compassion and kindness. Here, the suggestion is, um, of course, we can also imagine Vajrasattva as bringing us this healing nectar, uh, allowing us, it says, uh, pouring into us and all sentient beings through the crown of the head, filling your body, completely washing away all obscurations and wrongdoing and negativity until no trace is left your body completely pure and transparent as crystal. And we'll do that as a Tonglen practice. So we'll make that transformation with Tonglen. And then our fourth power, I love this one, is the power of resolve. 
the determination to not repeat those harmful actions. To me, that really just feels like a very solid intention. So here I am working with one of the obscurations on my path, really to the point that I see it, I experience maybe some nausea or regret. I purify it, bringing it through the process of Tonglen. And then I'm determined. I set my clear intention, no more. This is something <clears throat> my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood, talks about a lot. We need to have compassion for the ways that we unintentionally harm ourselves and others. We also need to have that resolve. Compassion may not be enough. We have to actually feel firm, strong, and clear at our boundaries and what we won't be repeating. Through these four powers, all your obscurations will vanish and all the qualities inherent in the enlightened state will begin to shine like the sun emerging from behind the clouds. Okay, so do you have a clear obscuration in mind? Very good. All right. So let's give ourselves a moment to come into a posture that supports our practice. Feel free to turn yourself at an angle or turn the computer at an angle or dim your screen. Or if you'd like to feel the presence of support and Sangha here, welcome to have the screen on. Let's find our way to a posture that really gives us the sense of dignity that this practice invites. Connecting to the length of our spine. Inviting relaxation and ease through the forehead, around the eyes and the cheekbones. Relaxing through the jaw, through the neck and the chest. and relaxing through the belly. Finding a place where our hands can comfortably be folded in our lap or placed on our thighs. And checking in to see if there's any last adjustments to the posture that will support you in stillness. And as we begin the transition into this practice, give yourself this wonderful, rare, precious gift of practicing in Sangha. And consider that any of the unfinished conversations, things on your to-do list, emails to return, they'll be waiting for you. Invite them to wait here not join you as much as possible in our practice space.
Invite your attention and awareness to fully pour into your body. As though pouring a vase full of water. And feel into all the seams and edges. Feeling into the subtle movements, the warmth and coolness. Feel this sense of the body from within the body itself. Maybe the body has aches, tightness, no problem at all. As much as possible, allow the aches to simply be aches. Don't make them a problem. And instead, invite your attention to more narrowly focus on the breath traveling in and out of the nostrils. Breathing in, receiving from the world. Breathing out, offering back. Bring a gentle curiosity to each breath as though following a sacred journey. while still feeling connected, grounded in the body, with this focus, this curiosity on the breath. Feel or imagine as though you could lean back, gain a little spaciousness of mind. Each breath, each moment, an opportunity to experience that natural state of body, speech, and mind. The body with stillness, the speech with silence, the mind, openness, clarity, luminescence.
in this initial phase of settling. Of course, the mind will wander, become distracted and return, and wander, become distracted and return. But is it also possible to notice something else deeper in our nature? Might we get a little glimpse of that gold, that sunlight, that intrinsic basic goodness, which is always already here? And let's take a moment here to connect to our intention. An intention which tonight may feel personal, maybe some area we really need support in. And remembering our greater intention and aspiration for the awakened heart, the heart which can be of service, seeking out, supporting all beings. And we'll shift our attention and focus now to this first stage of practice in this purification, calling upon these strengths. bringing to mind some area of our life which we feel is an obscuration, a habit of mind, a habit of body, a habit of speech, which does not serve us, which does not serve others. I'm taking a moment in the presence of Sangha here to seek support, recognizing each of us has at least one, if not many, obscurations we're working with right now. And taking a moment to feel the support, the presence of showing up here, shared purpose.
And though, of course, we are silent, let's feel that sense of support from one another, sharing in this. And then gently shifting to the next phase of practice in which we get clarity, giving ourselves a moment to really see the impact, the cost, the consequence of this habit, this behavior. How has this way of being, this obscuration, held us back? How has it impacted others? Allow your heart to tenderly see and feel the pain of this. With this clear seeing, we feel the strength again of our spine, as well as the softness and the gentleness of the face, the chest, and the heart. You could start imagining the pain and challenge and difficulty that this habit or pattern has caused us. Imagining it as though we could pour it into a little dark pool of smoke right in front of us. And maybe it's something that's been around for weeks or months. Maybe we can't even remember a time before it. Whatever quantity, we just pour it into the swirling cloud of smoke hovering in front of the belly button line. And then we gently shift our attention towards once again, that sense of intrinsic already okayness at the heart. A swirling cloud of smoke is in front of us and we start to feel the radiance and the light at the heart. And as a practice here of antidote, in our process of purification, we bring forth those tendrils of dark smoke right in front of the area of the heart. And as we exhale, we radiate out through the heart. 
melting away that darkness, that regret. Inhale, drawing in, sensing and feeling the heaviness, the weight of the regret. Exhale, transforming with our own goodness, our own true nature, our own clear light piercing through. Let's continue this process of drawing in, exhaling out, transmuting. A couple more breaths here, really steadying our mind and our heart. Engaging with this full practice. Seeing and feeling the regret. Inviting, creating, generating the antidote. One last breath, any remaining tendrils of smoke drawn in. And then radiate it out, that sunshine through the cloud. And taking our last step here, the step of resolve, of clear intention. Considering and being aware of what needs to change, what must shift in order for us to progress on our spiritual path. Feeling that as a sacred task, sacred vision. Feeling this intention maybe as a word or a phrase. A sense of responsibility, even a vow. What we plan to cut through what we plan to see more clearly, what we plan to just cease. Here with the support of Sangha, feeling the goodness of this resolve. It might take days or weeks or lifetimes. Any way we can get closer to that gold of our heart is worth it.
allowing the resolve to settle into the body, to the background. And just spending last remaining breaths here, connecting once again to our body, speech and mind. Thank you for your practice. I'd love to hear from folks reflections on that practice, on that process, our first of two processes of purification tonight. You can raise your hand or write in the chat. The regret part can be really challenging. It can be hard not to spiral there, I think. Curious for folks, I think, yeah, how that went, how that part of just facing the reality. Claudia. Yeah, the part that you, um when you had us reflect on how we have harmed others, it kind of like hit me like, oh my God, it, it became like so, I don't know how to describe it, but I mean, like I became so much more aware and I felt, I feel bad about having hurt others, you know, but then, when you, um, I think the next part, when you asked us to, I guess, have compassion, I could feel the different steps of like, yeah, of having that self-compassion. And that was, that felt really good. And also joy, when you started talking, I, I did feel some joy when you started talking about our a true nature and how it started revealing, you know, it just uh, was really healing. Mm. It was very good. Very good. Thank you. I'm so thank glad you. to hear that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I think <gasps> it is a lot to, to see the impact and to kind of have that sobriety, it's painful. And then the reality that though we have resolve, we're gonna slip back into our habits and patterns. Um, and it is, it's tough. It's interesting because it then becomes a training in that kind of tenderness and also um, determination. You know, we have to be tender with ourselves when we relapse into our habit and keep going. Yeah, keep going. Thank you. Leanne, up so late. Thanks for joining us. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I felt um, a lot of attachment to the negative. And I'm sort of coming in in that state and was going to ask like what your quick fixes are, your magic fixes <laughs> for uh, days when, um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the obscuration or defilement has been a feeling of hopelessness mm. and of just like stemming from, I think, a lack of discipline and togetherness. Um, like in a nutshell, just from personally in terms of artistic pursuits and career and having a window to work on things, but having insomnia and just feeling really unfocused, mm. like every creation is hard and being like, this is actually impossible and I, I'm not equipped to do it. And like, oops, I've already thrown all of the opportunity away and I'm doomed and it's too late and whatever. And mm. so, yeah, how to, and so I was sort of working with that today and I definitely found moments during the meditation of like softening around that and certainly in the Tonglen, but I'm still sort of left with like the <laughs> whatever yeah. of, like, <sighs> and a, almost like a resistance. And of course the thing yeah. hope that you like let yourself off the hook because you're like, well, can't do it anyway. So stop trying. Um, yeah, yeah. No, thanks for bringing this to us. And here we are, your support, right? Start one. I, I think it's really important to be honest about that. I know there's a lot of, at least I know a handful of um, artists here in our Sangha and, you know, to have that time and opportunity and then the pressure that brings, right? Um, what I'm hearing in your observation really is self-criticism. Um, hopelessness is one feature of that. And I think it's one I shared earlier, I can really relate to. Um, and I think it's a really powerful demon, right? For those who did demon feeding last week. And it really, um, I do think it's, it's, it's essential to see its cost. Um, and to actually, you know, as though we could wrap our own heart around ourselves to feel, um, you know, the pain of self-criticism towards ourselves, you know? And at least for me, when I connect with that, I can go back as early as I can imagine in my life. And this sense, sometimes, you know, really insidious and sometimes really clear, like you can't do this or you're blowing it or, you know, this and, and really feel, you I think you have to first feel the true tenderness and pain of that, right? That's almost like you're, you're just recognizing the cost. And that is a needed part before we antidote it. So I think you're actually doing really well, though it may not feel good to kind of see the rawness and the pain of it. And then, you know, the, the, the trick is always, um, I do think the breath and I think breath by breath, especially when we're in like an acute phase of our habit or pattern. Um, so I was reading um, this beautiful book by Trumpa last week. And he says that each exhale is an offering that we can make. Um, and I really like that um, as, a, as a concept. And so we think of inhaling, right? The Tonglen practice and just one breath of inhale, like whatever the thought is, like I'm blowing it. Just inhale, allow yourself to recognize, I think I'm blowing it. And then with the exhale, it doesn't even need to be words, just love, just release. Again, I know you've heard me say this before, it may not feel like it's doing much the first time. It may feel it's kind of like exercise. You're like, but I've been doing this reps. When are they going to work? But they do. They, they become, they go from something we are effortfully applying to something that will naturally come with us. Um, I'd love to tell you that in my, my long practice of working with self-criticism that I don't have self-criticism. No, I, I still have it, but the distance between criticism and compassion is so much shorter. So I'm on to myself. Like I know that when I am critical and tearing my, myself down in subtle and not subtle ways, very quickly, I do feel my own arms or my own heart wrapped around myself. 
and that's that's freedom right that's freedom and i'm sorry you're having this experience it sounds um totally hopeless inducing and the good news is it'll change <laughs> it'll change um not of course we don't know if it'll get harder and then better or just better but yeah glad you're here with us tonight thank you okay i see heidi says very useful practice trying to balance between our innate goodness and self-criticism yeah it is and i and i do think you know i think again we have over um probably over um articulated capacity to be self-critical but we do have to look at ourselves clearly i would almost say can we try to balance self-clarity and innate goodness you know really recognizing um how we can get out of our own way but we can't do that unless we believe at some level that we're good and again not because we're special not because we did something great but because all of us are good we're good um and then from sylvia and gina uh, i felt regret as pain in the body mm. um hard to take but little by little, I felt some release, a sort of relaxation came over me. Oh, that's from Gina, thank you. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that the regret feels like pain. You know, of course, all of our emotions are embodied. And when we bring to mind something that's difficult, we re-experience the emotion. That's the upside and the downside, because the upside of that is we get to work with it. And then we get to know what that feels like. And the downside is energetically, we feel it. Uh, hormonally, we feel it. Physiologically, we feel it. Um, and to tune into the pain of regret. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I mentioned this, but I, I truly get nauseous when I think about some of the habits and patterns that I most want to let go of that hold me back. It's just like, oof, gosh, I'm, so, I'm just like, because it, it's disgust, right? Not just regret. It's like, oh. Can I just stop doing that thing? Um, great. And from Walt, uh, having been a raging alcoholic for many years in the past, I now continually have to work hard at not wallowing in remorse, experienced as a self-satisfying ripening of my karma. <laughs> I deserve the suffering. I earned it. Oof. Yeah. Wallowing in remorse. Um, I think it it is, it's its own trap, you know, its own, um, its own way of actually kind of bypassing in a lot of ways, some of the hard work. I notice about for myself when I'm wallowing, um, I'm completely inaccessible to others. Cause I'm like, no, no, they don't even want me. I'm like, mm, like this thing is so bad. And it's, it's interesting for me, that helps me pull out of it. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear how you pull out of it while if you're willing to share, because I think we could all use that insight and wisdom. I hear from Denise. I love the wording about the sacred breath. My body felt it. Yeah, it really, it's really, you know, it's again, the simplest thing that we do all the time to survive that we don't need to think about. What an amazing thing to bring our awareness to. The breath. Um, Leanne writes, um, the sense of deserving it makes it hard to bring compassion to self-criticism because you recognize the criticisms as valid. Mm. Yeah, I think the piece with criticism um, or self, like the difference between self-clarity or self-criticism, if we wanna make that um, distinction. With clarity, we, we actually are not holding on. We're not identifying. 
we're not attaching ourselves to what we've done wrong. It's the not wallowing piece, like Walt said, right? We don't, we can do, we, we don't want to just pretend everything I've done is okay. If it isn't, right? If we, and yet we can't kind of hang out there and we can't associate it with the truth about me. So I think where we get really mixed up is we think something we've done is who we are. Some pattern we've gotten stuck in is the entirety of us. Just not true, right? Just not true. Problem is a lot of these patterns, again, they're so old and familiar. You know, we think they are us. I don't know if Mace will remember it better than me, but I'm thinking of, um, you know, the author and um, therapist, Resma Menikin has a beautiful thing about how um, kind of, what is it, culture over generation starts to seem, do you know, do you remember it, Mace? Yeah, it's something like um, personality trait, like a trauma taken out of context yes. in the person looks like it becomes a personality trait and in the family becomes culture oh becomes no and the person becomes personality and the family becomes a trait and in society becomes culture but right. it's all about he calls it decontextualized trauma right so these traumas you know that we've faced or experienced or created we start to think they're us we identify with them we create a whole structure around trying to avoid them or deny them and they're not us purification is not easy um you know, it, it, it is a big practice. <laughs> nice, Claudia, putting in the Donna practice in there. <laughs> like, I like that plug. That's good. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought that I had sent it to everybody at the beginning, and I guess I made a mistake, and so I just Probably. did it right now. <laughs> but, um, but I have a question, um, yeah. Eve, because, you know, now that you guys are talking about trauma, and what Leanne said about hopelessness, sometimes I feel, I mean, having come from a very, very dysfunctional family where there was a lot of trauma, I feel hopeless sometimes mm. also that, oh, you know, I'll never change or it, this will always be with me no matter how much therapeutic work I have done, you know, it's like, so... <laughs> I think you said, yes, you can, si se puede, but <laughs> it's hard. It's, it's hard. Re it's really hard, you know, to. It's hard to for think a that you can overcome. People. Yeah. Those traits, I mean, you know. Part of the reason it's hard, Claudia, is when we're so close to it, we don't even see the changes as they're happening. So we get discouraged, right? So, and I do think, you know, again, I do think hopelessness. Uh, wallowing in remorse, like these feelings can become these refuges. Like it feels terrible. Why would we want to do it? But it's a lot safer in a way, right? Than sometimes than the resolve, than the, you know, excuse my language, fuck it, I'm done, you know, moving on. That's hard. That actually, that takes quite a lot of energy. Um, you know, the, the despair and hopelessness and the wallowing. Um, it actually can be this strange refuge. It's familiar. Like, oh, it's not going to work anyway. And it's not working. And I'm still messed up. And right. And it's really tough. Um, and again, I don't think we see our progress as much. I don't think. And, you know, I think what's so beautiful, you know, part of this practice baked in is that antidote. And you'll see a lot of writing about antidotes to destructive emotions as cultivating their opposite working with generosity, working with loving kindness, working with empathetic joy. So we don't just kind of tough it out like, oh, I'm just going to face it, going to have that resolve. You know, we're also cultivating these other beauties of the heart. And Leanne, I, I do think now um, quick tricks is rejoicing, you know, just rejoicing. If we can't get out of our own, um, you know, rumination cycle, being able to feel good about others. And that might be like, so I, I just recently, I'd never seen the movie Frida. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Um, and Sama Hayek, my God, she is beautiful. Um, and to see, I know about Frida's life, but to learn more and to rejoice in her resilience, 
not an easy life. So much beauty. And to let our heart and mind rest there. So when we feel tired, you know, let ourselves rejoice. That can be a, a kind of an important antidote and something we need to be doing alongside this work of regret and resolve. And um, it's really important. Um, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, Keep I just, going. I, yeah, I just wanted to say I have seen some improvement in, you know, some of my destructive emotions, but I suppose it's like one step forward, <laughs> two back sometimes, and it's a lifetime work, right? I mean, yeah, it seems to me. Anyway. And what's the alternative, right? <laughs> and that's the thing. Uh, again, my teacher says it's between worse and terrible, you know, it's like, so yeah, I'm so happy you're on this path. Thank you. Jason and then Sylvia, yes. Hi, yeah, um, I just wanted to say so, something really struck me, which is wallowing as a refuge. And that is, it, it's really interesting how um, that really strikes a chord with me of, mm. of, of like, yeah, there's a part of me that um, the, the suffering part of me wants to keep suffering I mean, this is real time mm. kind of brainstorming around this, but but the the wallowing is like, oh yeah, I like suffering. And it's mm. like, what is going on there? You know, there's a sort of weird attachment to suffering as a thing, which then becomes the key to, uh, for me, it's, you know, understanding addiction, which is when when I'm really present with my addiction, I'm actually overcoming it and feeling the gift of overcoming it mm. as the as like ah that's that's the key that's it that's the wisdom there is like if you're if you tend to that sort of behavior which is very there's everything you know there's the baits out there you catch it all the time and you go for the ride and all of a sudden there's a point where you're like wait a minute okay see i'm addictive i'm addicted to this thing my phone social media you know it's gone from mm. alcohol and really bad things to like little things but they're just as bad they're just as erosive mm. and the um there's nothing like a retreat to help you see how clear it is yeah and then there's the feeling of oh i have to give that up and then there's the, the sadness of that mm lose you know sort of like okay now i'm not going to have that anymore well that's my friend you know now i now i'm wallowing in my own but but again just this process is going toward i'm addicted to the suffering mm. which is mm -hmm. the same thing that's going throughout all of my experience the suffering is the consistent thing and i just now saw tonight just as fucking that suffering is what i actually am attached to and continuing to attach to and that's the hardest thing for me to let go of somehow. And so mm. the word wallowing brought that up. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you for bringing that to all of us. That is a very powerful insight unfolding. Um, I'll be very yeah. curious how, how it goes because of course you are not your suffering. And yet, um, you know, it, I can imagine, um, yeah, there is a, just a weird comfort, right? In those... It's really, um, I would say the, the rec, the recognition of it is, is that it requires grief to separate suffering from, from the, uh, from the thing that, that makes us, you know, the negative aspect of suffering, the grief is required to move it into sadness and joy. And if you, I've been really like grief, I'm not so cool with grief. I don't really, you know, somehow that's not easy for me. And so I continue the suffering and continuing mm. the sort of really complicated. Mm. But the grief, if I just let the grief happen, then I'm like in this realm of sadness and joy. And sometimes the sadness mm -hmm. is so sad, I feel really, I, I can't take it or whatever. And sometimes the joy is I'm, I'm, I'm in a limited bandwidth. And if I can get through the grief, then I've got mm -hmm. the gold, you know. The gold mm. is there. I just feel like I'm constantly yeah. trying to avoid it. It's, I don't know. I've been through a lot of this. This, this tonight has helped me focus a little bit more on, oh, it's suffering. 
Thank you. Beautiful. If you're up for some spiritual homework, I would uh, prescribe you, you know, three to five Frank Ostaseski talks. Yeah. He makes Frank, grief. Well, how do you put it in the chat? I'd love to check it out. Yeah. He makes grief so approachable. And he is an alchemist. He makes it into meaning mm. and he makes it into joy. Um, I just am so grateful for him. Um, yeah. So, are, are, so just, just to, just to kind of go a little deeper into that, you're saying the alchemy is between is, is I could understand, I can make a connection between what we were talking about, which is suffering can become joy, you know, like mm -hmm. if that's through grief. If, but if you can't get to the grief part, you're in the suffering, you know, that's for me, what I'm experiencing. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, um, we can suffer in our grief. I think suffering is the, is, I would call suffering agitation or protest. Uh -huh. Grief to me in the way you're describing it, I think is a surrender, mm -hmm. um, which could feel like a collapse, but which actually is probably just a yielding. I mean, in a way with suffering, we're still protesting against life the way it is, but that full grief yielding is, is bowing to life. Mm. Hard, you know? Um, it requires a lot of willingness and acceptance. Yeah. Protest is very helpful. That word makes me realize that's what I'm doing. Because I think of resistance. Mm. Protest is yeah. far more um, on the money, I think, because it's like, yeah, I'm protest. Yeah. I don't want to do this. There's part of me that's like, I'm yeah. going full out of protest. So we we want to control, right? We're like, not this way, you know? It's It's amazing. Yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you for sharing with us, Jason. I know it means a lot to, to all of us to hear this insight. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Sylvia. Well, I want to say that I envy everybody who feels so strongly. I think that they are the chosen ones because there are others who feel so lightly or feel nothing, hmm. or they cannot express pain. And they are swimming in pain, hmm. but they ca cannot express it. They can't even feel it. They are paralyzed. Hmm. So uh, I don't want to put myself there because I am a happy person. And uh, Hmm. To go away from that, where, that past, that, that road, road, mm -hmm. that road can take me, I don't know where. Hmm. Um, how come that I feel shivering and trembling hmm. just from thinking that not feeling it's the worst the worst mm. the worst you never get to know anything so um for many 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 years i knew how to evade pain i was a master of evading i was a magician hmm. I had friends and we, and I laughed with them and we, we laughed and we went and and my love has been the greatest and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then tonight I feel a lot of pain mm -hmm. and I feel it in my heart. Mm -hmm. thank you yeah as hard as the pain is what you're pointing out is the alternative is to be a magician right and to be really not of this world because um, we're not in this world which is this is a world of suffering 
this is a world of pain and to avoid it and deny it is actually to avoid and deny our humanity and our ability to really connect. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe I'm saying it, but I'm, I'm happy for the pain in your heart. Yeah, I am. Thank you. Hmm. Beautiful. Okay. So Walt shares with us, he gets out of the wallowing by realizing there's really no difference between self-centeredness of wallowing and the self-centeredness of the alcoholic, i.e. the only feelings that matter are my feelings, all caps. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a, it's a powerful trick. Um, and Mary shares, uh, oh, Mary, thank you. Put the actual, uh, um, she put the actual um, thing that Resma wrote. If, if folks don't know Resma Menekin, really incredible teacher, author, writer, uh, and really helps understand the pain, the physical pain of racialized trauma in the body, in all bodies. And um, he writes here, many times trauma in a person decontextualized over time can look like personality. Trauma in a family decontextualized over time can look like family traits. Trauma decontextualized in a people over time can look like culture. It takes time to slow down so you can begin to discern what's what. And what Resma um, suggests and implores um, us to do is to feel that and recognize that through the body, not a conceptual experience. That's why I'm happy for your pain in your heart because we can't just think about these ideas we actually have to feel our way with them or else we're gonna try to think our way through it and end up just spinning and circling around it all. Um, Lucy appreciates your share, Jason. So relatable in that longing for suffering. And Mary shared Frank. Wow, Mary, thank you. Uh, Frank Ostaseski's videos. Oh my gosh. I uh, Some of you know I lost my mom uh, about a year and a half ago and Frank has been such a helpful person for me on that journey. Just really appreciate him. Um, Jason writes, meta for feelings. Yes, may I be happy, may I be glad, may I feel sorrow, may I feel sad. I love it. Beautiful. So we're, we're gonna transition now um, to our second practice, uh, which is just beautifully set up for, we've been tenderizing the heart here um, so I am going to skip just a tiny bit. I will come back to it if there's time, but on page 134, Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche again, he does one of these kind of beautiful, um, self-proclaiming, um, reflections on essentially on support, on regret, uh, on antidote and on resolve, but he describes it in these beautiful lines, things like, um, I have sunken into the ocean of samsaric misery. The burning flames of anger have scorched my stream of being. So his regret is very flowery. But what I want us to look at actually is, is the very last, uh, almost last passage here that is an anonymous text, which I also appreciate meaning that there's you know, no author and yet it is so powerful. And this is instructions on how to use the powerful thoughts of hatred or attachment to train us on the path using both forms of bodhicitta. Um, so he says, um, the Tantra speak of using negative emotions as the path, but that would be impossible if we just leave them as they are. In the collection of the sutras, there are many teachings on how we apply one's mind to these emotions and use them on the path while radically overcoming them. Take the example of desire and attachment. When this occurs, either spontaneously or by contact with an external object, reflect as follows. This is desire. If I do not get rid of it, purify it or overcome it, it will lead me to unimaginable suffering and to the lower worlds of existence. But if I purify it and control it, 
that will lead me to perfect Buddhahood. So that's what I'll do. Then mentally take your enemy, the emotion, the emotion of desire attachment, and let it grow more and more as you would if it were med meditating on altruistic love. Then add all the desires of all beings, including those that are only latent, so they completely fill your mind. Then think that through all beings being free from desire and attachment um, and reaching Buddhahood, this is the way to practice using the relative bodhicitta. Your own desire, as big as a mountain, only came about through thoughts, and the same goes for others' desires. And desire in itself is a production of mind. But when you observe your mind, when your mind observes itself, it can be seen that past thoughts no longer exist, future thoughts have not arisen, and the present thoughts are devoid of any form. Okay, so essentially, he's walking us through this interesting practice. I've read about this in a number of different places, where instead of trying to immediately avoid or transform our difficult emotions, we invite them to get big. I've seen Sokni teach this too. So we think of, for me, uh, one of the destructive emotions I'd really like to work it with is being frustrated and feeling like I'm right, AKA blaming someone, right? So when I'm just like, oh, I can't believe they would do that. What's wrong? You let it get as big as it can be. And then you imagine, I could actually transform this blame. But let me just invite everybody who blames other people. I'll invite all of their blame too. And imagine feeling all that blame together. And then in that moment, you transform it. And you kind of create this wish of freedom for everyone. So it's such a Jedi mind trick. I, I, I don't know, I think Buddha probably came before the Jedis, but this idea of turning towards our difficult emotion and then realizing how powerful it is and realizing everybody has it, taking it all on so then we transform it in that moment. So we're gonna do that for just a minute or two, just as a little practice. So this can be fun. Think of a recent obscuring emotion. Think of when you really wanted something and it just filled your whole mind, prevented you from thinking about anything else. Or when you really didn't want something, you really didn't like it and you just couldn't stop thinking about it. That kind of flavor. For me, the aversive one comes easier, but for others, it may be that desire. So this really, without a whole lot of uh, attention to the perfect posture, imagining this as an on-the-spot practice, just bringing to mind, you know, that, that difficulty, that challenge or feeling, that heat, if it's anger, that longing, Maybe we have a sense of it in our body. Maybe we feel clenching around the jaw or tightness in the chest or belly. Maybe we can't bring the full force of it, but we know it's imprint. We know that feeling. And we see it for what it is. We see it for not an emotion which we can let go of easily, an emotion that can cause harm, that we might enact in a way that hurts ourselves or others. And we open our awareness to recognize that so many people feel this. We imagine we could take on all of the weight and the burden of that emotion from all beings. Just bring it here. Maybe it feels like a whole ton worth of weight sitting upon us. All of that frustration or longing, all of it. And then we just gently, slowly, clearly 
extend this wish to be free, not only for ourselves, but for all beings. May we be free of this disruptive emotion. May we see its true nature as fleeting. May we have the wisdom to transcend the pain of this emotion and the harm it can bring. Imagine this wish radiating out to all beings. All beings be free. All beings understand the true causes of suffering, true causes of happiness. That all beings would know this powerful alchemy and antidote, transforming our obscurations. I'm just imagining the collective merit of this Sangha tonight, the generosity of these gathered beings, bringing our hearts and minds so clearly, so soberly to one another. The wonderful perseverance and enthusiasm, the discipline of bringing ourselves to this practice. The wisdom of seeing clearly. May all this merit truly be for the benefit of all beings. Thank you, Sangha. Thank you, Claudia, for hosting us tonight. Mm -hmm.